सब्सक्राइब टू आवर यूट्यूब चैनल एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन सो दैट यू नेवर मिस एनी वीडियो लेसन फ्रॉम राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल हेलो एंड वेलकम टू डेली न्यूज सिंप्लीफाइड एंड आंसर टू वॉट वाई एंड हाउ ऑफ न्यूज पेपर रीडिंग फ्रॉम यू पी एस सी सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन परस्पेक्टिव नॉट टूडे लेट अस टेक अप द न्यू डेली एडिशन ऑफ द हिंदू न्यूज पेपर डेटेड ट्वेंटी सेकेंड ऑगस्ट टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू now these are the list of the news which we will be taking up for today's discussion and the time stamp has been provided in the youtube description now in today's newspaper most of the articles and news which has appeared have already been discussed in the previous dns so what we have done in today's dns is that we will take up the context or try to understand the context of each of these news and then we'll revise what has already been discussed in the previous dns So on this note let's take up this news appearing in the text and context section about face recognition technology so it says that delhi police's use of facial recognition technology when was frt first introduced in delhi and what are the concerns with using the technology on a mass scale now this topic becomes important both from your governance perspective under gs paper 2 and also from the perspective of technology under gs paper 3 and this news of face recognition technology has been discussed in detail in the previous dns so on this note let us revise the facial recognition technology which has already been discussed the first news to be discussed appears on page number 2 it says facial recognition technology law yet to catch up now this particular news highlights about the facial recognition system which is currently being used by the police however the article suggests that as of now there is no active guidelines by the government of india so it is in this regard let us understand about the functioning of this facial recognition system about the fact that there are no active guidelines and because of this there are chances of misuse of this particular technology especially with respect to violation of freedom of speech and expression as provided under article 191a of the indian constitution as well as right to privacy under article 21 of the indian constitution so let us understand first of all about the basics of automatic facial recognition system also referred as afrs and also certain challenges with respect to its functioning now this particular news highlights that there are no specific guidelines with respect to use of afrs however by early march 2020 use of afrs was approved by ncrb that is national crime records bureau which functions under the ministry of home affairs so according to ncrb afrs that is automatic facial recognition system will use police records and will be accessible only to law enforcement agencies to prevent its misuse and according to ncrb accessible of afrs technology only to law enforcement agencies will facilitate better identification of criminals unidentified dead bodies and missing and found children and persons so the automatic facial recognition system basically uses a software which recognizes records and matches the faces of individuals against various government databases and these databases have photos or videos of individuals taken from public or private sources now this particular aspect brings into light the right to privacy angle now right to privacy under article 21 of the indian constitution has already been declared as a part of fundamental right in the ks putta swami judgment so any law which is to be made by the government which violates right to privacy must fulfill these three criteria that is the criteria for legality the criteria for need and criteria for proportionality now we understand that right to privacy under article 21 is just like any other fundamental rights and on any fundamental rights government can impose reasonable restrictions so invasion of privacy must be justified on the basis of a law which stipulates a procedure which is fair just and reasonable and this is what has been provided in the putta swami judgment and accordingly any law made by the government of india regarding invasion of life or personal liberty must meet these three four requirement basically of legality need and proportionality now with respect to legality it says that there must exist a law which prescribes for these reasonable restrictions on right to privacy and these reasonable restrictions must be based on certain need which has to be defined in terms of legitimate state aim 
that is the state wants to achieve certain objective regarding restriction on privacy rights and regarding proportionality it says that there must be a rational nexus between the object which is to be achieved and the means which is adopted to achieve the said objective that is imposing reasonable restrictions on right to privacy so the point to be understood here is that any fundamental right including right to privacy is subject to certain reasonable restrictions but these reasonable restrictions must meet the three fold requirement as stated in putta swami judgment regarding right to privacy so regarding restrictions on right to privacy this article says that rapid deployment of facial recognition system by the government without any law in place poses a huge threat to privacy rights and freedom of speech and expression so accordingly this article states that the government must provide certain specific guidelines regarding use of this facial recognition technology now we have already seen that the afrs technology functions with respect to a software however the software used by afrs is slightly different from the facial recognition system which is currently being used by different smartphones as this is based on iso 19745 standard which is meant for consumer biometric whereas the technology approved by ncrv for afrs the software is more restrictive as it measures facial features and then uses the measurements to create a template to be matched against other persons now important points highlighted here is that this afrs technology software is meant to work in various light conditions detect makeup plastic surgery or aging and also work against sketches of subjects so according to ncrb automatic facial recognition system will have access to different government databases such as passport aadhar immigration visa foreigners registration tracking database it will also be available to ministry of women and child development regarding the khoya paya vibhag as well as the national automated fingerprint identification system now this software can match a photo against many photographs available in the database and then compare one photograph with another and more the number of photographs which the database has the better is the output now with respect to the functioning of afrs the government has installed a centralized web application which will be hosted in crime record bureau's data center in new delhi which will be made available to all police stations in india so all police stations in india having sufficient internet infrastructure can have access to afrs technology to track criminals in their area now another very interesting fact is that this facial recognition system is also used by interpol that is international police and it uses the interpol face recognition system and the database of interpol is very large as it receives photographs or images from 160 countries which makes this a unique global criminal database now ifrs that is interpol face recognition system is coupled with an automated biometric software application and this system is capable of identifying or verifying a person by comparing and analyzing patterns shapes and proportions of their facial features and contours the thing which we generally see in movies so the facial recognition system generally takes into account the following factors such as aging of a person plastic surgery cosmetics effects of drug abuse or smoking on the person as well as pose of the subject now for the proper functioning of this software working with good quality images is also very important as a good quality image of a person will help the software to compare and analyze patterns shapes and proportions of the facial features and contours of the face of a person further it says that low or medium quality images may not be searchable in the ifrs system and even if they are searched the accuracy of the search and the results themselves can be significantly affected now this particular aspect brings into the picture the various challenges which can possess in case the ifrs system does not function properly so the different challenges regarding unregulated use of automatic facial recognition system can be said to be number 1 
violation of fundamental right to privacy as well as freedom of speech and expression. Next, such unregulated use of AFRS will increase illegal mass surveillance by the government without proper regulations or need. Further, it also leads to profiling of citizens based on religion or even color in foreign countries. Further, such a technology helps to automate discriminatory policing as such a system can lead to racial profiling. Further, such a technology can also be used to target the protesters against any government through identification. And this overall impacts or affects a citizen's fundamental right to liberty as well as freedom of speech and expression as provided under Article 19.1a of the Indian Constitution. Now the article also mentions about two important challenges. First is a false positive and the second is a false negative. Now false positive basically means that the use of AFRS system leads to false identification of some other person. That is, it identifies some other person who is not an actual criminal or who is not an actual accused in a particular case. So this can lead to falsely implicating someone else who has actually not done the crime. And the next problem highlighted is with respect to the problem of false negative. Now here the system does not recognize a person at all. Now this aspect of false negative can lead to exclusion of people from government schemes or policies as they will not be identified by the AFRS system. And this aspect of exclusion might impact a sizable number of vulnerable sections of the population who are dependent on various government policies. So these can be said to be some of the challenges with respect to unregulated use of automatic facial recognition system. Further, this article highlights that Delhi police as of now is using this technology of AFRS that is automatic facial recognition system for wider security and surveillance purpose. And it was also used to identify the people involved in violence during the anti-citizenship protest in Jamia Millia Islamia. Now all these activities by the police raises doubt about the security as well as surveillance by the police. And mass surveillance on individual actually violates rights of citizens in India. So this article effectively argues that the government must come up with a law on use of automatic facial recognition system as it will ensure that the use of AFRS is based on legality, need and proportionality as per the Putta Swami judgment on right to privacy. Now based on the aspect of reasonable restrictions and fundamental right on right to privacy, this particular question asked by UPSC in the October prelims of 2020 becomes very important. The question asked was, a constitutional government by definition is a, options were a, government by legislature, b, popular government, C. Multi-party government and D. Limited government. Now we understand that a constitutional government by definition is a limited government as powers of the government are limited through the constitutional provisions. And this can be easily seen with respect to fundamental right which has been provided under part 3 of the Indian constitution. As state cannot take away fundamental right of citizens at its will. So state cannot arbitrarily take away any of the fundamental right of a citizen as per the constitution of India. So in this regard, this particular question becomes very important to understand as it gives us the thought process based on which UPSC has started asking questions, especially in the section of polity and governance. Now this topic on AFRS that is automated facial recognition system becomes important from the prelims as well as means point of view as questions in prelims can also be asked and it gets covered under Indian polity and governance and in the mains gets covered under GS paper 2 as well as GS paper 3. Now under GS paper 3 this gets covered under challenges to internal security as well as role of media and social networking sites in internal security challenges as well as basics of cyber security. So it is in this regard this article becomes very important from our examination perspective. With this, let's move to the next article of discussion. Now the next important article in today's newspaper appears on page number 7 in the article section. And this news is regarding the recent Supreme Court judgment on PMLA and also the powers of enforcement directorate. Here the author has highlighted that in upholding the constitutionality of PMLA, that is Prevention of Money Laundering Act, the court has resurrected the ghost of ADM Jabalpur. Now this particular topic has already been discussed in detail in the previous DNS whereby we not only discussed 
the supreme court judgment which upheld such expanded powers of ed or enforcement directorate under the pmla but we also discussed about the powers of enforcement directorate or rather the expanded powers of enforcement directorate post 2019 amendment so here again let us revise what has already been discussed regarding the 2019 amendment and also the important supreme court judgment which has upheld the expanded powers of enforcement directorate now the first news to be taken up appears on page number 10 in the editorial section now this news is regarding the recent supreme court judgment on pmla and also the power of enforcement directorate now a petition was filed in the supreme court against the misuse of power of enforcement directorate which is empowered under pmla now according to the 2019 amendment its powers were significantly increased and one of the division bench of supreme court had earlier stated one of the bail provisions as unconstitutional because it violated article 14 and also article 21 of the indian constitution so to understand the supreme court judgment let us first of all go through some of the amendment which were made in the pmla in 2019 and how it expanded the powers of enforcement directorate now this topic becomes important both from the perspective of gs paper 2 and also gs paper 3 particularly gs paper 3 where this topic gets covered under the aspect of security particularly money laundering and its prevention and also various security forces and agencies and their mandate and under gs paper 2 this topic gets covered under important aspects of governance now talking about the expanded powers of ed particularly regarding the 2019 amendment let us go through some of the provisions as has been highlighted here so the first point highlighted here is regarding the expansion of scope of money laundering as per its definition provided under section 3 in the act now this amendment has added an explanation to this particular definition of money laundering and this explanation when read along with this particular provision that is section 21u then we understand that the act of money laundering is not a one time act and it can be said to be a continuing offense now section 3 of pmla has defined the offense of money laundering and the 2019 act has further provided for this particular explanation so the important part of this explanation is that the process or activity connected with the proceeds of crime shall be a continuing activity and continues till such time a person is directly or indirectly enjoying the proceeds of crime by its concealment or possession or acquisition or use of projecting it as untainted property or claiming it as untainted property in any manner whatsoever so it simply means that the crime of money laundering is not a one time act and it can be said to be a continuing act if the proceeds of crime are utilized either directly or indirectly now the term proceeds of crime has been defined under section 21 u now it says that it means any property derived or obtained directly or indirectly by any person as a result of criminal activity relating to scheduled offense now offenses under pmla has been categorized as scheduled offense under part a part b and part c so any scheduled offense or value of such property or whose property is taken or held outside the country then the property equivalent in value held within the country or abroad now the explanation added to section 21u with respect to definition of proceeds of crime is that it says that for the removal of doubt it is clarified that the proceed of crime includes property not only derived or obtained from schedule offense but also property which may be directly or indirectly be derived or obtained as a result of any criminal activity relatable to the scheduled offense now this means that not only the activity which has been categorized under the scheduled offense under part a part b and part c but any other criminal activity which can be associated with this criminal activity now this is also referred as predicate offense that is any activity which can be linked to money laundering thus the amendment of 2019 not only expanded the meaning of money laundering but also made predicate offense or those offense which can be linked to money laundering also punishable as money laundering or related to money laundering 
Now coming to the second important part of the amendment introduced through 2019 is regarding section 44 of PMLA. Now section 44 of PMLA provides for offences to be tried by special court. Now let's understand this through an example. Suppose Mr. A has been charged with money laundering and there are two separate cases going against Mr. A, one in a special court on charges of money laundering and one in a regular court on issues associated with money laundering. The charges of Mr. A are absolved and the investigative agency could not prove that Mr. A was involved in money laundering. And this case of money laundering which you started in the special court has now been closed. However, the case regarding Mr. A which can be associated or linked to money laundering still continues in the regular court. Now it is possible that upon request by the officers this particular case which is going on in the regular court can be transferred to the special court. And when such case is transferred to the special court then it cannot be said to be continuation of the old trial or it cannot be termed as a joint trial because the earlier case has already been closed in the special court and this case which was carried on in the regular court has now been transferred to the special court. So this is a new case and in this new case if new evidences are found then the authorities or the enforcement directorate can frame more charges or subsequent charges based on new findings. So this is another aspect which was added through the 2019 amendment. Now let's look into the third point which is very important particularly with respect to section 45 of PMLA. Now in this also amendments were carried on through 2005 amendment and also 2019 amendment. So this provision provides for offenses to be cognizable and non-bailable. So all offenses charged under money laundering are cognizable and non-bailable which means officers authorized under PMLA can arrest any person without warrant however subject to the conditions of section 19. Now section 19 provides for two conditions. First is that accused shall be informed of the ground of arrest and the second is that accused must be taken to special court or judicial magistrate within 24 hours. Now these provisions have also been provided under article 22 of the Indian constitution. So this part of the provision becomes important or significant as it overrides the provisions of CRPC or criminal procedure code because all offenses under the PMLA will be categorized as cognizable offense and officers can arrest without warrant. So this give wide powers to the enforcement directorate to make arrest of those persons charged under PMLA. Now coming to the second important part of section 45. Now here section 45 imposes a twin conditions for release on bail. So it says that a person accused of more than three years shall not be released on bail unless the public prosecutor has given opportunity to oppose the bail. So when the public prosecutor who is the advocate on behalf of the government opposes the bail then it gives very less ground for the person to be released on bail. And the second ground is that the court must be satisfied that if the person is released on bail then he will not continue any illegal act pertaining to money laundering. So these twin conditions makes it very difficult for the accused to get bail if charged under the offenses of money laundering. Now it was here regarding section 45 that a division bench of supreme court that is a supreme court bench comprising of two judges in the case of Nikesh Tarachan Shah versus Union of India held that imposition of these twin conditions under section 45 of PMLA grossly violates article 21 and 14 of the Indian constitution and hence is unconstitutional. However, the Nitesh Tarachan Shah judgment has been overruled by this present Supreme Court judgment regarding the twin condition and it has now been declared as constitutional. Now apart from this, various other allegations were alleged on enforcement directorate on misuse of PMLA. So these other grounds which were charged in the petition was that ED does not disclose the enforcement case information report. Now this is almost similar to an FIR. 
This document that is ECIR is considered as an internal document and hence not given to the accused. Now according to the allegation this amounted to denial of basic rights of knowledge of any charges to the accused. Now, according to ED, registering of ECIR is as per ED's discretion and after ECIR is registered, ED begins to summon accused person and seeks details of all their financial transactions and also of their family members. Now another allegation was that the accused is also called upon to make statements or provide statements which are treated as admissible in evidence without disclosing the accused the charge under which they were booked. Now generally according to the criminal laws any statements given by the accused during police interrogation cannot be used as an evidence in court of law. However statements made to ED either under threat or under any pressure can be made admissible in evidence and these charges are generally not disclosed to the accused. So the allegation is that this process violates article 20 clause 3 that is right against self incrimination because article 20 clause 3 says that no person can be compelled to become a witness against himself or herself. So the allegation states that throughout this procedure the accused does not even know the allegations against them as the only document which contains the allegation is the ECIR report and which is not supplied to the accused persons because according to ED it is their internal documents. Now another allegation was that PMLA does not distinguish between an accused and a witness while they are summoned. And this is important because procedure under criminal law makes a distinction between accused and a witness. Now another set of allegation is that picking up of cases by ED are politically motivated and based on affirmation from the central government. So more or less these are some of the allegations which has been alleged against the misuse of Prevention of Money Laundering Act by the Enforcement Directorate. So after understanding the allegations imposed against ED and also the expanded powers of ED through the 2019 and other amendments, let's go through the highlights of Supreme Court judgment as it had stated that there is nothing wrong in the expanded powers of ED to control the aspect of money laundering in India. So after understanding the amendments, let's go through the Supreme Court judgments. So the first point highlighted by the Supreme Court is that mere concealment or possession or acquisition or use of proceeds of crime will amount to money laundering as defined under Section 3 of PMLA. So basically Supreme Court affirmed the expanded meaning provided under Section 3 and also Section 21U whereby proceeds of crime has been defined. Now another very important highlight of the judgment is that the Supreme Court stated that in cases of money laundering the burden of proof is upon the accused and not upon the state. Now this means that the accused has to prove their innocence and state has a compelling interest in imposing stringent bail conditions for economic offenses including this reverse burden of proof. So imposing stringent bail conditions does not violate any of the fundamental rights including article 21 or even article 19. And in cases of money laundering the burden of proof is reversed and it is upon the accused that they prove their innocence. Further the Supreme Court also upheld ED's power to arrest, search, attach and even seize property in cases of money laundering or in offenses related to money laundering. Now we saw regarding the twin bail conditions provided under section 45 of PMLA and here the Supreme Court upheld that is declared that these twin conditions of bail provided under section 45 are very much constitutional. Further the Supreme Court held that section 45 of PMLA is not arbitrary even after the 2019 amendment and the amendment carried on in 2019 is reasonable and has a direct nexus with the purposes an object sought to be achieved by the act and cannot be said to be arbitrary or unreasonable. Now the 2019 amendment provided that any offence under money laundering or any offence under PMLA would be cognizable and the officers can arrest the accused without any warrant. And section 45 will override any provision of criminal procedure code. Now the Supreme Court further stated that statements made by accused to ED 
are admissible in court even though the statements are provided either under coercion or under any pressure or any fear and the statements given by the accused does not violate article 20 clause 3 of the indian constitution and the reason provided by the supreme court was that section 50 of pmla is in the nature of inquiry and ed officials are not police officers so here the supreme court made a distinction between officers of ed and police officers and stated that only those statements given to police officers during interrogation becomes inadmissible and since ed is not a police officer hence any statement given to ed or its officers are admissible in court of law further the supreme court said that providing a copy of ecir which is an internal document of the ed is not necessary and the supreme court also stated that ecir cannot be equated with first information report filed in a police station here the supreme court held that supply of ecir or providing ecir to the accused is not mandatory and only disclosure of reasons during arrest is enough now regarding violation of article 22 the court stated that as long as the person has been informed about the grounds of their arrest it is sufficient compliance of the provision of article 22 clause 1 and in this case it cannot be said that article 22 is violated so mere information about the charges to the accused complies article 22 and hence there is no need to provide ecir which is an internal document of the ed further proceedings under section 50 are in the nature of inquiry and not criminal investigation and hence ed officers cannot be equated with police officers especially regarding the aspect of investigation and hence the rules of criminal procedure code regarding investigation does not apply to members of enforcement directorate now regarding providing stringent bail conditions the court stated that accused charged under pmla are a separate class of criminals and the offense of money laundering has been regarded as an aggravated form of crime all across the world and hence forms a separate class of offense requiring effective and stringent measures to combat the menace of money laundering now related to this the supreme court also stated that the offense of money laundering is equivalent to terrorism and hence stringent measures are required to reduce the menace of money laundering including prosecuting the offenders and also attaching and confiscating the proceeds of crime which has a direct impact on india's financial system and also sovereignty and integrity of the country and lastly the supreme court also stated that inclusion or exclusion of any particular offense in the schedule to pmla is a matter of legislative policy and the nature or class of any predicate offense has no bearing on the validity of the scheduled offenses thus a wide range of predicate offenses could be made part of pmla which can be associated with money laundering so these are some of the important highlights of supreme court judgment which upheld the constitutional validity and also the powers of enforcement directorate to provide stringent conditions of bail and also its powers to reduce cases or instances of money laundering in india which can be equated to financial terrorism now the amendments made in pmla in 2019 was carried through the finance act of 2019 so on this particular aspect the supreme court has held that this matter must be decided by a seven judge constitution bench as it involves important questions as to which matter can be introduced as a money bill now based on our discussion this becomes your practice question for your mains examination the question is critically analyze the supreme court judgment which upheld the wide powers provided to enforcement directorate to investigate money laundering cases this question carries 15 marks thus this editorial becomes very important both from the perspective of gs paper 2 regarding governance and also under gs paper 3 regarding internal security and also money laundering with this let's take up the next news for discussion now the next news to be taken up appears on page number 2 it says residents cry foul as waste plants set to expand one of the crucial solutions to clear landfills is to increase number of waste to energy plants 
So this article highlights that the LG of Delhi has allowed increasing capacity of waste to energy plant in Okhla by 1000 ton per day. And this will result in increase in energy generation from these waste to energy plants. However, the residents of the area have raised concerns regarding toxic emission from such plants and also the health hazards because of increasing capacity of such waste to energy plant. Now let us revise the important highlights with respect to waste to energy plant from the previous DNS. There is an article on page number three, citizens group object to the proposed waste to energy plant. They say that the consequence of this on plant and on human health and on a Ravali ecosystem will be enormous and irreplaceable. See, waste to energy plant and the technology used in this is extremely important. UPSC in 2019 has asked a question in the context of which of the following the term pyrolysis and plasma gasification mentioned. The answer of course is waste to energy technologies. So waste to energy technologies is an important topic for the mains that you will be writing next year. First of all, let us see importance of converting waste to energy or the importance of waste to energy power plants. Niti Aayog under Swachh Bharat Mission envisaged using waste to energy power plant as means to waste management and developing good sanitation in cities. Because of rapid urbanization, India is generating huge amount of solid waste. Our urban solid waste generation is around 62 million tons every year. Because of this high waste generation and because of new opportunity opening in the energy market, waste to energy has more value than just environmental. The municipal solid waste to energy market presently is growing at 9.5%. There is huge opportunity in terms of economics, industrial development, employment generation, etc. If we talk about waste to energy conversion from organic matter, waste to energy conversion becomes even more pertinent because according to many estimations and the one given by food and agriculture organization, 40% of food produced in India are wasted. When waste are converted to energy, the waste in the process of conversion are also processed or to say otherwise, they are made less toxic. So the waste which ultimately comes out of waste to energy power plant that can be used in safe landfills and that will cause less harm to land and to water bodies. Because of sustainable use in terms of landfills or in terms of construction material, the energy coming from waste is considered as renewable energy. According to estimation of Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, India has approximate potential of 5700 megawatt that can come from urban and industrial waste. Waste to energy conversion is also a sunrise industry. Government is incentivizing this industry and it is becoming new business opportunity for entrepreneurs. If we can develop more technology for waste to energy conversion, that will have other spin-off benefits. One, we can give this technology to other Asian countries. And two, if we are successful in conversion of waste to energy in terms of urban waste or organic waste or industrial waste, then we can venture into treatment of sewage waste as well and also hazardous industrial waste. Waste to energy is an important topic for the mains examination for economics, for environment and also for science and technology. However, despite these benefits, waste to energy power plants in India have not really taken off. Presently, there are around 186 waste to energy plant in India. This number is little old. We did not have updated data on this. This is of September 2020. As in when you get the updated number on this, please update your notes. The total cumulative installed capacity of waste to energy power plant are around 320 megawatt. Niti Aayog envisages developing power plant capacity of waste to energy power plants of around 800 megawatt. So a large gap remains to be filled. Also, as per the report of Center for Science and Environment, half of the waste to energy power plants are defunct or they work with very low efficiency. So obviously there must be some problem with India's waste to energy power plants. First of all, the municipal solid waste in India have low calorific value, meaning the amount of energy that can be drawn from unit mass of solid waste is less. 
and the municipal solid waste in india have high moisture content when the moisture content in the waste is high better more advanced and costly technology are required simple thermal heating when the moisture content is high result in low conversion of waste to energy also since the municipal waste in india are mostly unsegregated there are high inert element in the waste that does not help in conversion of waste to energy the use of pvc in india is very high pvc is a kind of plastic polyvinyl chloride because of presence of chlorine it becomes even more carcinogenic than normal plastics so the pollution from india's waste to energy power plant is high and as discussed because of low calorific value that is because of higher presence of inert content and high moisture content the cost of electricity generation from waste to energy power plants in india is high presently it is around twice the cost of that of coal based power plant one of the technologies used in waste to energy plant is biomethanation biomethanation technology so far were imported but recently csir in collaboration with other institute has started to try out biomethanation technology in india as well with indianization of the technology perhaps the cost of electricity generation from waste to energy power plants in india will be reduced then because of issue of pollution that we have discussed because the waste are not segregated and because of pvc usage in india there have been protest and criticism of waste to energy power plant for example one very prominent protest was staged against okla waste to energy power plant people in general are having negative attitude towards waste to energy power plant even though the energy created from them are considered as renewable the technology used for waste to energy conversion can be classified into four categories the most basic rudimentary fundamental method of converting waste to energy is thermal conversion basically you heat up the waste at high temperature that leads to degradation and complete oxidation of waste at that elevated temperature however you would understand that even carcinogenic emission will be very high in this case everything will be broken down everything will be boiled up you will not have any fuel product you will only have thermal product maybe in form of emission hot gas and that you can use to heat other things up converting heat energy into some other form of energy when you have organic matter as waste and that organic matter is non biodegradable then thermochemical conversion technologies can be used this is a little upgradation from thermal conversion although in this as well waste is heated at high temperature but since this is organic matter you get some fuel product as well especially when the moisture content in the waste is less then thermochemical conversion works better the reason being when moisture is less you can have producer gas which is mixture of carbon monoxide hydrogen and some amount of carbon dioxide as well if you have more moisture then you will not have the producer gas in this pure form then again you will not have a fuel product you will only have a thermal product some emission hot gases but you will not have a fuel product something that can be used further as fuel an upgrade from thermochemical conversion is biochemical conversion chemical conversion meaning you will have some fuel product and biochemical would mean that you will have enzymatic decomposition of organic matter so here you had organic matter but the organic matter was not to be biodegradable mostly non biodegradable but biochemical conversion can work better if you have high percentage of organic biodegradable matter only then the enzyme can perform their function and for enzymatic action you also need to have high level of moisture so this method is ideal for organic products ideal for vegetable food wastes they are organic biodegradable and they also have high moisture content in this method you will get fuel product and not just random emission of hot gases you can get methane out of this you can also get some kind of alcohol methanol or ethanol when the waste predominantly produce methane through the process of biochemical conversion then that technology or the process is called as biomethanation methanation is for production of methane and methane is a very good fuel with high calorific value then we have electrochemical conversion this is a very advanced form of waste to energy conversion technology it uses microbial fuel cell cell is a kind of battery fuel cells are one that uses fuels to charge up the cell that can be done through chemical action that can also be done through microbial action 
microbial fuel cells uses the oxidation reduction machinery in the microbes. So you will have a fuel cell, you will have electrodes and you will fill it up by the waste and you will add microbes in it. The microbes will carry out changes and there will be inherent reduction oxidation machinery working in the microbes that will be used to charge up the electrodes. But however, this technology is at very nascent level and in India, it has not been implemented in any of the waste to energy power plants yet. Perhaps in future it will be done. Now let's talk about way ahead. We have seen the advantages, we have seen the problems. Now let's see how to fill up the gap. To deal with any major issue in the country, you must have a policy. For waste to energy conversion, the state governments must come up with clear policy with regard to allocation of land to the power plants, the supply chain that will deal with the supply of garbages, the wastes to the power plants. We have seen earlier that the use of PVC in the waste to energy power plant creates carcinogenic emissions. And because of that, the pollution caused by these power plants are very high and hence the protest. Waste Management Rules 2016 already has asked to phase out PVC. We need implementation of this. There must also be proper implementation of Municipal Solid Waste Rules 2000 that aims at ensuring segregated solid waste. Because of non-segregation, inert material in the waste becomes very high. The calorific value of the waste decreases and the efficiency of power plant reduces. That results in high cost of energy generation. In order to implement the policy and legislation, you need to have proper functioning institution. Municipal corporation that is responsible for collection of waste and then supplying it to the waste power plant must be strengthened, both in terms of human resource, training and finance. Niti Aayog in its vision document has asked for establishment of waste to energy corporation of India. This has not been done yet. In order to develop waste to energy power plant as a promising industry that will not only solve the environmental problems but will also be economically very beneficial, we must have an overarching body like this. Then we must have infrastructure development. We already have around 186 waste to energy power plant but according to the recent report of Center for Science and Environment, half of them are defunct. Many of them work at very very low efficiency. China has more than 300 waste to energy power plants and it has set a national target of using one third of the waste in these power plants. You know, Sweden is a country that imports solid waste because it can convert waste into energy with very high efficiency. So we need to create infrastructure both in terms of number of waste to energy power plants and the technology used in those power plants. One of the suggestion is that railways, which itself creates lots of waste from the canteens at railway station, from the catering services and train, can establish waste to energy power plants near big railway stations. Then there has to be certain model through which the governance, the administrative structure of waste to energy will work. One of that is power purchase obligation. Delhi Metro recently has started receiving 2 megawatt energy from 12 megawatt waste to energy power plant in Ghazipur. Large energy consumer like metro and railway and other businesses, they can be asked to have a power purchase obligation from these waste to energy power plants. K. Kasturi Rangan committee recommended PPP model for waste to energy plants. Many of the PPP model have come up, but for creation of more infrastructure, more thirst must be given for PPP model. Waste to energy power plants recently in India have been facing difficulty because of protest coming from public. Difficulty is also at the stage of land acquisition, land clearance and once the power plant is up and running, then also they face protest. This is largely on account of high polluted emission coming from these power plants. So first that needs to be set right and then people must be made aware of environmental advantages of these waste to energy power plants. More technology needs to be developed. The technology that we are working with, A, they are imported and B, they are not very advanced. We can cooperate with countries like Sweden for technology transfer. Now the next article for discussion appears on page number 7. It says what next on data protection law after the central government has withdrawn the data protection bill. So here the author says that there are two issues involved. First, the form that a new law will take and second, the nature of protection the new law will offer. So here the authors in this article have suggested 
that there is a need for better accountability when a new law for data protection is legislated by the government. And here in this regard, the authors have welcomed multiple legislations as suggested by government to incorporate various aspects of data protection. And these include protection of privacy laws, protection of digital economy, prevention of monopolization of data through competition law or through the aspect of anti-competitive practices and also right-based approach. Although the right-based approach has been criticized, as right-based approach has been heavily taken from the EU GDPR or European Union General Data Protection Regulations, still there is a need for right-based approach to ensure that the fundamental rights, particularly right to privacy, which has been incorporated as a part of Article 21 of the Indian Constitution through the famous Putta Swami judgment, should be incorporated. So to understand all these aspects, let's revise the importance of data protection law and also certain challenges. So recently, the government withdrew the personal data protection bill that it had tabled in the Lok Sabha in 2019. The bill had undergone intense scrutiny by joint parliamentary committee and now the bill would be replaced by a new bill that fits into comprehensive legal framework. So why did government had to bring a bill on data protection or data regulation? And the origins of this bill can be traced in a very significant judgment known as case Putta Swami versus Union of India case, where the Supreme Court of India in 2017 upheld the right to privacy as an intrinsic part of the right to life and personal freedom guaranteed by Indian constitution. In the light of this judgment and the concerns around how large tech platforms were handling the personal data of its Indian users, the center in 2017 set an expert committee chaired by retired Chief Justice, Justice B. N. Sri Krishna to formulate a regulatory framework for data protection. The Sri Krishna committee submitted its report and a draft for data protection bill to the Ministry of Electronics and Communication Technology in 2018. The bill that was tabled by ministry in parliament over a year later was however criticized by Justice B. Sri Krishna for giving much more control to central government over the data than envisaged in the committee's draft. And so, because of these criticisms, the government had to withdraw a bill. And there are four main reasons behind the withdrawal of the bill. First was that the Joint Parliamentary Committee had recommended 97 corrections and improvements to the bill. One of the key recommendations is widening the ambit of the bill to cover all data instead of just personal data, thus moving it considerably away from Putta Swami origins. The stated view of the government is that in the face of such a radical overhaul, it is better of course to bring a new bill. Alongside this, the government has also said that it received several concerns from the tech industry, specifically from Indian startups, regarding the stipulations on data localization in the bill. Then the second was issue of data localization. Personal data was defined in the bill as any characteristic, trait, attribute or any other feature information that can be used to identify a person. The bill also identifies a subcategory of sensitive personal data, such as details on a person's finance, health, sexual orientation, practices, caste, political and religious beliefs, and biometric and genetic data. It also created a critical personal data category, which was personal data as may be notified by the central government. The bill stated that while sensitive personal data can be transferred abroad for processing, a copy of it must be kept in India. Critical personal data can be stored and processed only in India. It also stipulates the condition under which sensitive data can be sent abroad, such as government authorized contracts. Several countries have such localization provisions considering the strategic and commercial implications of the data as the new oil. However, businesses both big and small, international and local have issues with such localization clauses. Then a lot of concerns were raised by the tech industry. Indian startups have raised the issue that the infrastructure needed to comply with the localization stipulations will be a huge drain on their resources. Startups also often depend on international companies for services such as customer management, analytics and marketing which will require them to send data on their customers abroad. 
data localization requirements would not only reduce their choices on such services but also burden them with compliance processes the compliance requirements have implications for the larger us based tech companies as well with reports indicating that umbrella organizations of us like alphabet which controls google and their businesses were lobbying against the bill and then finally implications on and finally implications on social media platforms one of the joint parliamentary committee recommendation would also have been of particular concern for social media companies as it sought to move them from category of online intermediaries to content publishers thus making them responsible for the posts they host and so if the bill was passed facebook twitter and instagram could be held accountable and liable for inflammatory and derogatory posts and so because of these concerns the government had to withdraw the bill now it still remains to be seen whether the government comes up with a new bill where all these issues are addressed or most of these issues are addressed and whether it will be acceptable to all the stakeholders or not with this we conclude today's discussion and this is the question for the day